in improving right? what a good looking group we've got out there i think i'd buy a used car from anybody i'm looking at right now <laughs> Uh, just a few announcements as we get our uh, Sunday morning service started today. Uh, remote order might invite you, please bring non-perishable food items during the month of February. Uh, family size um, is better, not the super big industrial size, but the, um, the family size is large. Uh, the food will be distributed by the West Alabama Food Bank. This time of year is especially uh, helpful to them. You can put your donated items in the bins at the back of the sanctuary or by the glass doors by the parking lot. So either bins back here or the ones by the glass doors. Uh, choir practice has been paused until February. However, the youth group and women's group will still meet uh, on Wednesdays at 5.30. We also will say again, thank you for wearing your mask indoors uh, during worship. Uh, this is one way our church shares the love of Christ by doing what we can to protect, protect the most vulnerable among us. Now, if you would uh, stand as you're able and uh, let's have a call to worship. One body, one spirit, one hope. One, one Lord, Lord, one faith, one, one baptism. God of all, take, take this natural collection of people, people and quilt together your church. church. Let us share your warmth and grace with others. Let, Let us honor our differences, differences and, and work, work together for the good of all. Now if you will open in your hymnals to hymn number 529, our firm foundation.
times we thought so many things would be over right now. We thought that things would be back to normal, that the virus would be gone, and that our lives would be back on track. But what we're discovering, Lord, is that there are new paths for us moving forward. God, we come today and we bring you all of our weariness, all of our anxiety. We bring you all the worries that we have for ourselves and for the ones that we love. We come here this morning because we need to take a deep breath. We come here this morning because we need to hear a word from you. So God, we pray this morning as we worship together that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and speak to each one of us. Let us hear something in the music that is played. Let us see something in the beauty of the windows that surround us. Let us learn something from the faces of those in front of us. Let us find something in the proclamation of your word. We come here this morning, God, seeking you. And we trust, God, that today we will be found. For those who are cold, for those who are hungry, for those who are imprisoned, for those who are afraid, for those who are wandering. We pray that your Holy Spirit would come upon them and give them grace and peace. We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would guide them and us to a better place. We pray that your Holy Spirit would soften hearts and open eyes so that we can really see the needs of the ones that are around us. God, we thank you. We thank you for the beauty of this day. We thank you, God, that this story is not over yet. We thank you, God, that there are blessings just around the corner. We thank you, God, for the hope seen in the beauty of this world. We thank you, God, for more than peace. So hear our every prayer as we lay them at your feet. The prayers that we have set out now this week and the prayers of our hearts that are beyond words as we pray to you in the words that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now will the children please come forward for a moment of Christmas singing. Some of us are great musicians, some of us are good preachers, 
Some of us are bakers, are artists, are storytellers. We all have different talents. And they may not seem like much individually, but when you put them all together, when we work together, we make the church stronger. We can do things together with those talents that we might not can always do individually. When we all work together and cooperate, those talents are important. Just like we're all important. We're all wonderfully made by God. And we're all important even though we're all different. So, can y'all say a prayer with me? Mm -hmm. He said, thank you, God. For giving us special talents. Giving us special talents. Help, us Help us to remember. We are wonderfully made. And important. Amen. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in this opportunity we have to return to you a portion of the blessings you shower on us each day. Bless these, our gifts of tithes and offerings, that they may help us to further your kingdom. We also pray, Father, that you will continue to show us ways to be your voice, your hands, and your feet. In your holy name we pray. Thank you.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, beginning with verse 12 through 27. And I'm reading out of the New Revised Standard Version this morning. I think it's a passage that is very familiar to a lot of you. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot were to say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the eye were to, if the ear were to say, well, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole body were hearing, then where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, and yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Last week, I was asked to be part of a uh, pre-recorded virtual skit for a friend who's a pastor in Connecticut uh, her church is not meeting in person, both because of the weather and because of COVID numbers there. So she asked me to be part of this, this Zoom Brady Bunch skit. So there are people from all over, and each one of us in each of our little squares represented a different part of the body. Now, this is not Broadway. This was a skit written by some junior high kids. But the part of it that I thought was the most fun is where the body parts start arguing with each other and blaming each other. So for example, the eye says to the hand, it's your fault we all have COVID. You're always going around touching everything and putting your hands everywhere, and then you touch the eye, or you touch the mouth, or you touch the nose, and boom, we all have COVID. It's totally your fault, hand. And the hand says, it is not my fault. It's the nose. It's the nose that's breathing in the virus. It's the nose's fault we all have COVID. And the nose says, hey, leave me alone. I am the only one who gets swabbed all the time. It's not my fault. If you want to blame somebody, you ought to blame the mouth. If the mouth hadn't made everything political, we wouldn't be in this mess to begin with. And the mouth says, hey, it is not me. You ought to be blaming the feet. Those feet are going all sorts of places they have no business going. If you want to blame anybody for this, you ought to blame the feet. The argument between all the body parts was personal. It was animated, and it was angry. It wasn't a polite disagreement um, the way that we often read this scripture. Uh, I have no need of you, kind sir. <laughs> or, I don't need you, but thank you very much. No, 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 no. This was not a polite argument. When Paul uses this metaphor, there was serious hostility in the church. In the early church, um, the church in Corinth was a hot mess. And part of it was the larger culture that they were in. The Christian community was just this tiny little subculture in this big major city in Greece. It was a transportation hub that linked two seaports and bays, so the city was home to a great diversity of people, Greek, Roman, Jewish. There were 12 major pagan religions in Corinth, and there were great temples built to Aphrodite and to Apollo. And the Christian community, it was just this little tiny group of people trying to figure out their brand. 
um, and how they fit in the larger community. The first church at Corinth was having issues. They had members in their own little community that were Jewish and Greek. Some were rich, but most were poor. There were slaves, there were free people, and they were all raised very differently. Those who were raised in the Jewish tradition had a common culture, a common identity, a common uh, rituals, a common history. But the Gentile members of the Christian church did not have the same background. And at first, this little group of Christians were meeting in the Jewish meeting place, but eventually they moved next door into a Gentile home of a Gentile convert. So they were trying to figure out, you know, are, are they Jewish? Are they Gentile? Are they something else? And the question that they most debated was, that was making everybody mad, was what does it take to qualify as a real Christian, a real follower of Christ? What is the litmus test to be a real Christ follower? Now, here in Tuscaloosa, some people would say there's a litmus test to be a real Alabama fan. Oh, a lot of people are fans when the football team is winning and when they're going through the good years, but real Alabama fans stick with it through DeBoe and Francione and the Price years. In fact, I heard a story this morning that there was a coach in the 1950 called Ears Wentworth. His name wasn't Ears, apparently. He was known for his ears. Uh, and he used to go to the games with the university police chief, who was a man named Bud Rose and a member of this congregation. And so according to uh, the legend of Bud Rose, he'd be riding with Ears Wentworth to the football game where Wentworth was the coach. And Wentworth would say, I'd rather be out fishing. <laughs> it was that bad of a year for football. Some of us have sort of a litmus test for true Alabama fans. You know, a lot of people live in the US too. And the question is, what is a real patriot? a real American. And folks might begin to say, well, you know, you're not a real patriot unless you're part of whatever political party I'm a part of, or unless you think the same way that I do. This new church was trying to figure out its identity in a multicultural environment, and let me tell you, it was not going well. It was a young church, somewhat immature, divided on every hot button issue of the day. They argued about money. They argued about lawsuits, about immorality, insensitivity, competing religions, styles of worship, gossip, and lies. People started lining up behind their favorite former leader. Well, I belong to Paul. Well, I belong to Apollo. Well, I belong to Caiaphas. People were getting pretty tribal, and each group was confident in their moral superiority. Their way was the right way, and if you didn't agree, you were just less religious, or less intelligent, or less sincere. Paul heard about these divisions in the early church, and so he writes to the church at Corinth, and is pretty specific about addressing some of the issues that they're dealing with. Paul tries to give the church at Corinth some perspective by first holding up a mirror. In 1 Corinthians 10, according to the NIV version, Chapter uh, verse 23, Paul writes, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. He goes on to say, you ask me if you can eat this meat sacrificed to idol, an idol that you don't believe in. It's just meat. Sure, go ahead and eat the meat. Unless it causes somebody else to stumble. Unless it's such a big issue for somebody else that it's going to cause them harm for you to eat this meat. This is not a black and white answer. It's not like eating this meat is right or eating this meat is wrong. It's not even a question of context. Well, it's about your own personal beliefs and what you think about the meat or it's about where you're from and your culture. What he's saying to them is we are all connected to one another and the decisions that you make hinge on how it affects other people, other people who might not have the same perspective as you. 
He goes on to write, Christ is like a single body which has many parts. It is still one body. We are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. We are all part of the body of Christ. And that includes parts that we like and parts that we don't. Parts that work well together and the parts that are struggling. The parts that are obvious and the parts that are internal. We need each other. We belong to each other. I have to tell you, the United Methodists have done a pretty poor job at this as a denomination. Um, we've not done a good job at being one body. It's pretty clear that in the next few years, our denomination is going to split. And the most conservative folks among us are going to create a new denomination where the whole denomination will be conservative. And there won't be any discussion or debate over things like inclusion of the LGBTQ community. They're not going to wrestle with moderates and progressives on interpretations of scripture on many of the various issues that face our society today. It seems pretty black and white. In some, some ways, it might kind of seem like a relief, you know, to be in a place where everybody kind of thinks the same. And they're coming from the same place and maybe they have the same background or maybe they have sort of the same political leanings. The folks who will stay in the United Methodist Church will include conservatives and moderates and progressives. And that's a lot messier because not everybody reads or understands scripture the exact same way. That means that people will be coming from different experiences and cultures and languages and political parties and opinions. It puts the United Methodist Church in this messy community, much like that first early church at Corinth. Which begs the question, how do you even function in such diversity? Can it even work? Can it work in a church? Can it work in a community? Can it work in a family? Can it work in a country? Is it even worth the hassle of dealing with such a mess? Well, Paul's words are needed today as much as they were centuries ago in Corinth. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Not just the parts you like or the ones that agree with you. In other words, we can't call other people losers or deplorables. We are all one body. And at the head of this one body is Jesus Christ. So what does it take to qualify as a true believer, a real Christ follower? What is the litmus test to be part of this messy community? Well, the litmus test is how you care for others especially those with whom you disagree. We see it in stories of the Good Samaritan. We hear it when Jesus talks about loving your enemy, and we read it in this love letter that Paul writes to the Corinth church. We are all beloved children of God, beautiful, worthy, imperfect, loved. And I believe that God expects us to treat each other like that. No doubt, no doubt it makes it harder. No doubt there will be times that it's stressful. No doubt it would be so easy just to fall into this uh, body that argues with one another about whose fault it is. Uh, no doubt it's more difficult to forge a way forward. And yet, when Christ calls these uh, diverse followers around him, the tax collector, um, the rebel, the the uh, fishermen, when God collects all of these different people, he's giving us a glimpse into what the kingdom of God is supposed to look like. And, you know, spoiler, it doesn't all look exactly like we do. I think there's great hope in the church. I think there's a great hope when such a diverse body of people can come together and can say, you know what? Um, we are going to wrestle with the things that we need to wrestle with, but we are going to love one another. We are going to serve one another. We are going to put the interests of others and the interests of the, above, of the community above our own personal.
personal wants and needs. We are going to put into practice what it means to be a follower of Christ. I think that the church can show the way about how to do that. The church can show a way forward, um, not just to our community or our nation, but even to the world. And that's what God expects of us. So thanks be to God for this body. Whether you are an eye or an ear, a hand or a foot, or another body part that I cannot say aloud at church, know that you are part of the body of Christ, that you are loved, that you are needed, that you are worthy. And together, only together, are we whole. Amen.
As you go to this place, may you look into the faces of folks that you know and folks that you don't, people that you like and people with whom you disagree, and may you see Christ in their eyes. And may you show Christ through your words and actions. Go in peace. Amen.